Most people sitting in churches across the world would agree with the statement that there is no way to get right with God on our own. Right? Most people would agree with that statement. But here's the thing. We can know that statement is true. Okay? I knew that statement was true for a long time. <laughs> um, at least the better part of, of 15 years. But the problem is, is that while we can know that statement is true, that doesn't necessarily mean that we actually understand what that really means. Because I can honestly say for myself that for a majority of that period of time, I knew, I knew that the statement that we cannot get to God the Father on our own, I knew that statement was true. I believed that statement was true. But I didn't truly understand what that actually meant. You see, what we believe about truth, what we believe about the authority of God and God's word, what we believe about creation and the supernatural, what we believe about the true gospel has an effect on whether or not we buy into a thing called performance-based faith. And it is a mindset. Whether we believe that we can be good enough or, or, or accomplish our salvation by works. Last week, last week in, the, in the series that we've been going through here, this, the, the, the greatest and the biggest deceptive philosophies in our, in our culture, the greatest magic show on earth, last week we talked about how you know the, the true gospel and the false gospel, that there are two gospels out there, um, one of which is true, the other one which is twisted and false. Last week we talked about how, how most people live in a place of guilt and, and we live in this mindset that God is waiting to smite us at any given moment. He's just waiting, sitting there waiting to strike us down and punish us for what we've done wrong. Casting Crowns has a song a long time ago um, that kind of speaks to that very kind of mindset. It, it's, can you, can you show me again how far the East is from the West? Because I feel like I'm one step away from you leaving me this way. One mistake away from leaving me the way I am. And he goes on to say, can you show me just how far the east is from the west? He's trying, what, 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 what I believe is Mark, what, I think he's the one that wrote that song. What he's trying to convey is this idea of living in guilt. He's trying to combat that. Can you show me just how far the east is from the west? It isn't about what I do. It, it, you know, I, I mess up all the time. I am a sinful human being. I'm going to mess up. Show me just how far the east is from the west. You see, we, we have a tendency to focus in on our sin and our, our bad habits, and, and, and we get into this, 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 this beating ourselves up cycle that I've, I've talked about. You know, this is a cycle that just kind of goes around and around and around, and we get into this, this, this guilt kind of a mindset and what ends up happening is our self-worth and our self-confidence plummets through the ground. You see, we get guilty and we act out again to, and, 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 you know, in a self-comfort. It was in the addiction sermon, the very first sermon of the year. And we get into this mindset and we, we, we do something bad, we sin, and we get guilty, and we go back and we do it again to comfort ourselves, and we get guilty, and we go back and do it again, and we get guilty, and we go back and do it again, and we get guilty, and we go, I mean, it's an endless cycle that never, never stops. I can't tell you how many times I have personally said this. 
but it wasn't until about a year ago that I realized the implications of what I was saying. Go back to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, okay? We go back to the Garden of, of Eden. And, and, and again, I have said this more times than I can count on fingers and toes. I have said this over and over and over and over and over again that Adam and Eve, Eve screwed up. That Eve messed up God's plan. I didn't understand the implications of what that really meant. Because here's the thing. To think that we can screw up God's plan is prideful and arrogant. That is a place of nothing but pride, to think that we can mess up God's plan. My friend, you are not that powerful. You are not po so powerful as to mess up God's plan. What if, and I could be wrong about this, but what if, what if God created it this way on purpose? What do you mean, preacher? What are you talking about? What if God created this world the way it, way it is now on purpose? That Adam and Eve didn't necessarily screw up in the Garden of Eden. That they didn't mess up God's plan. Because if Adam and Eve, <clears throat> if Adam and Eve messed up God's plan then that makes Jesus a backup plan. And Jesus is not the backup plan because he was intended and crucified before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1.20 and Revelation 13.8 both speak to that. 1 Peter 1.20 says, For he was foreknown... He, meaning Christ, for he, Christ, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared to in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. He was intended from the beginning. Jesus Christ was not a backup plan. He did not, Jesus was not, Jesus was not first prophesied. Yeah, I've heard this one too. Jesus is first prophesied in Genesis 3.15 where the curse is pronounced and, you know, and, and the, the woman will um, have a seed and that seed will, you, you know, the, the, your head will strike his heel. That's not the first prophecy of Christ. The first prophecy of Christ was actually before the fall. And that is in the marriage of the man and the woman as a picture of Christ and the church. See, Christ was intended before the fall even, fall even happened. Hmm. Revelation 13.8. Revelation 13.8 says this. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, meaning the devil. This is, this is in context. This is talking about the devil, okay? The, the, the beast in particular, I believe. Um, let me start back in verse 7. It says, It was also given to him to make war with the saints to overcome them, and the authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Okay, this is, this is the Antichrist, this is the end times, is what this is talking about. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, the devil. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life and the lamb who has been slain. Again, Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world and there was a book written with everybody's name on it who would come to faith. Ephesians 3.9 Ephesians 3, I'm going to start in verse 8 for context. It says, To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. Verse 9, okay? 
and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. It was created this way on purpose. Why? So that the rulers and authority in the spiritual places will know the glory of God. So that the salvation that you and I have by the grace of God through faith would be a testament to the spiritual realm, who, by the way, cannot be saved. The angels who fell with Satan in the beginning, um, yeah, they can't be saved. And they will be judged by us, the church. That's the whole point of our salvation. See, our salvation isn't even about us. Our salvation is about a testimony to the angels that fell in the beginning, to the spiritual realm that they are condemned and stand condemned. The church is a testament to that. So what is the performance-based faith mindset? Well, Galatians 2 is where we're going to be this morning. We're going to kind of, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, we're, next week, we're going to actually go back. The way I had the series planned, this sermon was actually next week, and next week's sermon was actually this week. But the more I studied through it and looked at it, the two, the two sermons needed to be reversed because the true gospel and the false gospel and the performance-based faith need to go back to back. And then next week is going to follow up. So we'll actually go backwards next week. We'll be in 2-4 um, next week. But if you would, follow along with me. We're going to be in Galatians 2, 11 to 21, as a matter of fact. Okay. We're going to read 11 to 14 first, and then we'll go through 15 to 21. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For because he stood, uh, for prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he had begun to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? You see, Cephas here is Peter. Okay, that is Peter. And Cephas is his um, uh, other name. See, the first thing we see here is a pressure to conform that's not familiar in our world today is it there is a pressure to conform to the norm there's a peer pressure and we talk about peer pressure in, the, in regards, you know, you know, our kids, you know, in, in school and, um, you know, even from grade school, um, junior high, high school, all the way through, there is a peer pressure to conform. But I hate to say it, but peer pressure to conform doesn't just stop when you graduate high school. <laughs> peer pressure to conform is the norm of our culture. It just is. And this is exactly what's going on. You see, Cephas Peter is... is it is the definition of a hypocrite. He is the definition of a hypocrite here. Because here's what's going on, okay? Before certain men came from James, certain men being Jews, okay? Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. He would, he would eat with the Gentiles and, and, and fellowship with them. And, and, and my guess is not explained out here, but he would eat anything and everything that they ate. And he would fellowship with them because Jews are not supposed to fellowship with Gentiles. You know, that was another, another no-no in that realm. But when these Jew men came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof. Okay. And even Barnabas the encourager was carried away by his hypocrisy. Holding themselves aloof above the Gentiles. When Paul got there, 
Paul called him out on his hypocrisy. He goes, if you're a Jew, if you are a Jew and you live like a Gentile, how is it that you compel the Jew, the Gentiles to live like a Jew? If even yourself live like a Gentile yourself. In other words, from what we talked about in, the, in week one yesterday, or uh, in, in the first chapter of, of Galatians last week, the true gospel and the false gospel. Peter understands that it is righteousness by faith, that it's not about what he does. He is there, therefore understanding, because in Acts, was it uh, where the veil was torn? Was it Acts 10 or 11? Where, where he had this, this dream and vision that the veil was lowered and, you know, you can eat and under, he then understands that Gentiles, um, you know, it's a picture of the Gentiles and the Jews and that, that they're not necessarily unclean um, and that God has created every equal. We all have access to Christ. And Peter has forgotten that. <laughs> He's forgotten that. Absolutely unequivocally forgotten that. He's like, he, he has gone backwards and taken the faith which he understood and gone backwards into a place of legalism. That is the definition of a hypocrite. How many times in our church do we do the same thing? Do we harp on other people about their sins, but yet we do the same cotton-picking thing that they do? You know what most preachers, um, uh, uh, most, most preachers across the country harp about? The biggest thing that they harp about and harp about and harp about is the one thing that they can't let go of themselves. So if you have a, a guy that's up in the pulpit preaching against homosexuality, 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 guess what? There's something that he can't let go of. Just saying, you know, uh, it makes me wonder about the, uh, um, oh, that one church that goes out and pickets, um, Westboro Baptist, that's what it is. 15 to 21 go on, it says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Sorry, my allergies are still affecting my, my, my voice and my throat. We are justified by faith. We are not justified by works. At all. See, and the misconception is, is that you take this scripture and combine it with what James says in, two, in chapter 2 of his book, and that without works, you know, faith without works is dead. But the works that he's referring to is not what you do. The works that he's referring to is a biblical worldview according to that of God, not, not what you do. We are justified by faith, not by works. Because if we were justified by the works of the law, then there was no need for Christ to die. There just wouldn't be. And that's where, you know, Ruth had showed me this morning some of the, some of, she's got this little folder, fold-out thing of all the different religions of the world, what they believe about Christ and justification, all this stuff. And it just, it's a wealth of knowledge because you find out real quickly who believes what. How many faiths out there, like we said last week, are, are about works 
And it's about what you, what you do really matters. No, it doesn't. Uh, the details of what you do every day doesn't matter. Now, I'm not going to say that, that, that you know, we have a responsibility to love, because we do. But we take every moment in every situation as it is. If we mess up, we mess up. We learn from it. And we come to the realization in a biblical worldview that there's a problem with something in our lives. Guess what? <laughs> we got a responsibility to clean it up. <laughs> Which is the way it is. Somebody comes to my office and, and, and you know, they come off and, and you know, they're like, you know, I, I realize that, um, oh, I've got this drug habit, you know. Um, first step to recognize or solving any problems, recognizing there is one. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> now let's do something about it. You know, let's do something about it. If we rebuild, however, this legalistic nature of we have to do this, we have to do this, we can't do this, don't even go there because we're not even touching it. If we rebuild this legalistic kind of mindset, then we are rebuilding something that is not going to save us. And Christ died needlessly. You see, performance-based faith in actuality, is not faith at all, because this is the card trick from week one. This is where, this is where the card trick comes in, and he thinks he's got gotcha, you, or you think that you've got him. You know, he's sitting there performing a card trick, and, and you think he's messed up the card trick. He hasn't, because he's got you in a place that you are in nothing but bondage to a law and to legalism. We cannot manipulate God by what we do. We have faith in four things. We have faith in four things. Number one, that Christ died for our sins. We have faith that Christ died for our sins. And that blood covers our sin. The second thing is that we believe he resurrected to new life. And not only did he resurrect to new life, but we will too. We have faith that he was resurrected and that we will resurrect too. And again, I would contend, as I have said this many times, I would still contend that that, that new life is not just something that resurrected life is a resurrected life here and now and an eternal one. It's both. Okay. The third thing is that we are no longer enemies. We have faith that we are no longer enemies, but we are friends. And not only friends, but as Romans 8 says, that we are co-heirs with Christ. Not just friends, co-heirs. Okay. And the fourth thing, we have faith that it is the blood of the innocent is shed for the guilty. Because God demonstrated this when Adam and Eve sinned, it was a preaching of Jesus Christ. What did he do? He made animal skins for Adam and Eve. Have you ever thought where those animal skins came from? He sacrificed. God taught them sacrifice. He taught them that the blood of the innocent is shed for the guilty. It is righteousness by faith from the beginning. The first act after Adam and Eve fell was a demonstration of the blood of the innocent covers the guilty. Here's something that you need to hear and you need to understand. God does not need us to do something in order to, for him to move. God does not need you to move in order for him to move. Because if that's the case, then creation would have never happened because we weren't there. God created of his own free will. Right at the moment, let me give you a let me give you a modern example. There are numerous, numerous stories coming out of Muslim countries. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name the countries for the safety of the believers in these countries. Um, but there are, are people coming to faith in Muslim countries where no one 
No one has evangelized them. Nobody. Christ is appearing to them in their dreams. And this is not just one or two stories. This is multiple, multiple stories of things like this happen. God does not need us to move in order for him to move. He doesn't. He does not need you. He doesn't. He wants you. That's the difference. He doesn't need you to move. He wants us to move. That is the difference. A performance-based faith and the faith, the faith, righteousness by faith, actually, in, that, in all actuality, when you put them side by side, they do not look different. As a matter of fact, they look about the same. You know what's different? Your mindset and your perspective. That is what the difference is. We have freedom to do what we do as if under the Lord. Paul says that a few different places. We have freedom in our lives to do, as what we, to do what we do as unto the Lord. Now, we are not free to use that as a license to sin. He says that too. <laughs> we are not free to use that, that freedom as a license to, to just go off willy-nilly and, and, and just sin it up. That's a Gnostic gospel um, on the other end of the uh, spectrum. We have the freedom to serve at any given moment. Remember what it says in the latter part of Matthew, uh, I believe it's 25 and 26. When you have done unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. We serve because we walk in the Spirit. That's what the later part of Galatians says. We serve at any given moment, and when and knowing and knowing that when we sin, because it's gonna happen knowing that when we sin, we are still covered by his blood. And when we understand, not just remember what I said at the beginning, we can know these things. And, we tr and it's not necessary to understand these things. It's not necessary to understand it in order to be saved. You just, you just don't have to understand. It's not, it's not a requirement. But if God opens your eyes to the understanding and not just a knowing how not just knowing this stuff but an actual understanding on how this faith works it is going to revolutionize your life it really will it really will it's understanding the faith is not required to 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 be saved it just isn't We have to have faith that Christ died for our sins. We have to have faith that he resurrected. And that we will too. We have to have faith that the blood of the innocent covers the guilty. That's what's required for faith. And I'm telling you, when you understand how this works, you will see and hear things that you thought you understood before. My encouragement to you today is don't let, do not let churchianity or performance-based mindset throw you back into captivity again. It is a lie from the pits of hell. It is a lie. Don't be taken captive by fancy preachers and big names and lights and smoke and mirrors. Because you walk into any given church across the country, you will hear a performance-based faith gospel
And unfortunately, as we are going to tackle next week, the church has been infiltrated with this horribly. Millions have been deceived into a performance-based faith. Not saying they're not saved. Not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that they are taken captive and their maturity is stunted because somehow they think that what they do matters. It's why you live in a place of, a, of the guilt cycle. If you're living in that cycle, you are living in a performance-based faith. And the only thing that is going to set you free is Christ, is getting out of a performance-based faith. And understanding, and again, this I can preach to you day in and day out, and, but I cannot make you understand this. This is something you have to understand with God opening your eyes. It's God's responsibility to open your eyes. What's the second part? It is our responsibility to ask, to seek, and to knock. He is not going to open the eyes of somebody who's not seeking him. He's just not going to do it. I know I sound like a broken record, but if there's anything you get out of this series, that is it. Renew your mind in the faith. Renew your mind that God has to open your eyes, but you have to be asking, seeking, and knocking first. It is Matthew 7 over and over and over and over again. My question to you is where are you at? Are you weighed down by your performance? I was listening to Greg Laurie. What, Mom, what was that? Was that Friday night that we were um, on our way back from Sealing? That was, yeah, you were, you were at the concert. And Greg, I love Greg Laurie. But he is a performance-based mindset preacher. Because he sat there and said as much as he was, and I was like, oh, God. Not you. Not you, Greg. No. No, 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 no. That's Mark Lowry. Yeah, that's Mark Lowry. No. Greg Laurie is, a, is an, a, the Harvest Church out in California. Love Greg Laurie, but he is a performance-based mindset preacher. And when he said that, I just crumbled. I was so disappointed. Where are you at? Are, are you weighed down by this? I asked this a few minutes ago. If you are weighed down by your performance, let go let go seek him out search the scriptures as as ephesians 3 9 and 10 say search the scriptures for the mystery that has been hidden in the pages of this book it is there it is there